cool stuff. But I was making my way through probably the fourth or fifth chapter of, of my devotional for that day, and I wasn't really getting much out of it except a bunch of lineage stuff. And I'm like, God, I just want to get, I want to hear something that's going to feed my spirit today. And, and I was praying, why do I need to know this? And I heard the Spirit of God gently whisper in my heart, wouldn't you like to know your family's name is written in my book? <coughs> you know, God purposely recorded the genealogies of the Bible, as we testified this morning with the video, but also to reassure us that our names are written in his book, and nothing is there by accident. Amen? Amen. 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 Everybody say good morning to Dana. Good morning, good morning, Dana. And we're going to get started. I'm going to uh, open up with a word of prayer, and I want to pray for, we've got so many people. Marge called me this morning. Okay. Um, we are going to be talking about something that's near and dear to my heart this morning, and I've entitled this message for those of you who are taking notes. My mind, God's heart, God's garden. Yeah, that's my mind, God's garden. And our opening passage of Scripture is going to be 3 John chapter, well, there's only one chapter in 3 John. I think one of the most difficult jobs, one of the most difficult aspects of my job as a pastor is to watch people struggle in their faith. So this morning I am going to intentionally outline not only how you can have victory in your walk with God, but what God intends for the life of a believer when we come to the foot of the cross and we enter into a relationship with him. You know, Christianity is not a life insurance policy. You confess, you raise your hand one day, you run to the altar, you say, Jesus, I believe in you, and suddenly you've got a life insurance policy and you can go away from the cross, live however you want, and know that you're not going to a devil's hell because after all, you've been to the altar and you confess Jesus as your Lord. We fall so much short of God's intentional purpose for us when we believe that or we fall prey to that. God intends for us to enter into a relationship with him that thrives and we have communion with the life of the Holy Spirit who's living and walking and breathing in us. And so this morning we are going to this morning we are going to purposely see how we can do that to live in victory. Because it's for freedom that Christ died. Amen. Amen. So if you'll read with me in uh, the third epistle of John, we're just going to read the first four verses. But I want you to pay special attention to verse 2, because there's a phrase there that I want you to capitalize on. Maybe you will underline it, maybe you'll put it in parentheses. The elder unto Gaius, the beloved whom I have in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all things you may prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And there is the phrase I want you to highlight, even as your soul prospers. Because <coughs> you're not going to prosper in all things if you don't have a prosperity of soul. For I rejoice greatly when, I, when brethren came here and witnessed unto thy truth, even as thou walkest in truth. Greater joy have I none than this to hear of the of my children walking in the truth. How many times do you think John says in those couple little statements, opening statements to this letter, that the prosperity of the soul is attached to walking in truth? You might want to count them because there's something there to that. Now go with me to Genesis chapter 2. I can only tell you what I know from my own experience in Christ. Having walked with the Master for almost 40 years now, probably longer than that, if I were to count my first recollections of the Holy Spirit dealing with me as a young child, 
I've shared with you before that I came to my father when I was just a little boy and asked my dad, God, dad, who's the closest man to God on earth? My dad, uh, loving God and his faith, said to, said to me, well, quite naturally, well, son, the Pope is. I remember reckoning in my little heart that when I grow up, I want to be the Pope. There was just something in me very early in my life that wanted to be close to God and close to my father. I don't know why God chose to put that in my heart other than he destined me for salvation that I do not deserve today. Amen. But I'm so grateful. Because it is that clone, that it is that longing to be with God, to honor God and to love God. It is the Spirit of God wooing into us into his presence to live with him and to be in relationship with him. And this is the way it was meant to be from the very beginning. So let's read it. <coughs> Genesis 2, verses 4 through 16. Genesis chapter 2. Say yay, men, when you get it. Amen. Amen. I said yay, men. Yo, bro. Yo. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that Jehovah made the earth and heaven. Your Bible probably reads the Lord God. And no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth. And there was no man to till the ground. But there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward. In <coughs> and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord to grow every tree that is pleasant to sight, good for food, and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the river went out into Edom to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became four heads. The name of the first is Pishon, that is which compasses the whole land. Compasses the whole land of Havilah, and there was there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There has been bdellium and onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gahon, and the, and the same as that encompassed the whole land of Cush, and the name of the third river is Hidekel, that is, it which goeth in front of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden. And I want you to carefully focus on that. God put him in a garden, in the garden of Eden, to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded God, and the God, and the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. In the day that you shall eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. So from the very beginning of God's intention for creation, we see God putting man in the garden of Eden, breathing into his nostrils the breath of life. And that breath was the union of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. That God intends us for us to have a relationship with him. He breathed into our very hearts the breath of life. And that is what separates us from every other creature on the face of the planet. And if you ask me, I think that that's a picture, a prophetic picture of, of Jesus breathing into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. Because how many know Jesus was betrayed with a kiss? Isn't it amazing that God gives Adam life with a holy kiss, and God and man extracts life from God with an unholy kiss? God knew exactly what he was doing when he created us. Let's go over to chapter 3. Follow me here, guys. We're just laying a foundation. It'll all come into crystal clear focus in a minute. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am not losing my voice because I'm sick. Uh, oh, I did have a rough night last night. I was in here doing a couple victory hollers this week in prayer. And... <coughs> yeah. Sometimes you just have to go into the battlefield and shout a little bit. Got to fight the good fight. 
Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field and the Lord that the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, Of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was to be, it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was to be desired, and that the, it was a delight in the eye, to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took up the fruit thereof, and did eat, and she gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Now listen to verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves. What's the next phrase? In the presence, in the presence of the Lord God among the presence of the Lord. <laughs> I read this this week. I just started crying. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. I know there's a bunch of people in this room there. <clears throat> Parents, <coughs> how would you feel if you came home after work? Instead of your kids running up and throwing their arms around your leg, hugging your thigh, and say, Daddy, 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 I'm so glad you're home. They went and hid behind the couch because they knew that they had done something wrong. Kyle. <laughs> We've been on both ends of that spectrum, haven't we, as kids and as parents. I remember my mom used to scream, wait till your daddy gets home. She didn't have much patience, then she'd just deal with me. <laughs> it wasn't pretty. <laughs> and I had it all coming. God bless her. There's something to that phrase, hiding themselves from the presence of the Lord. And it's exactly what we do when we're cut off from God and our sins and trespasses. We hide ourselves from the Lord. And we get real good at masking that. Look at what it looks like. Living undercover. Covering ourselves up with fig leaves. I can't help but if I look at that verse, the first thing that stands out to me, they heard the voice of God. Why didn't they see God? Because they turned themselves away from God. We were talking this morning, and I've shared in my devotionals and also <clears throat> from the pulpit just a, a couple months ago, but Marty and Josanne and I were talking this morning and about this amazing thing about the five senses. When you see something, you can't unsee it. When you hear something, you can't unhear it. When you touch something, you can't untouch it. Amen? Amen. You ever smell something? I wish you could unsmell it. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Yeah. 